<laughs> I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Well, good morning, church. How many of you have watched uh, Charlie Brown Christmas yet? There you go. This year, yes. Yes, this year. Sorry, sorry. This year. And this Christmas season. Um, I have actually not watched it yet. Um, I usually wait till I go home, and then we just kind of binge watch. Usually my mom and I would just binge watch. Christmas movies, and so we'll watch uh, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas, Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, Christmas Vacation. Um, sorry, we, sorry, we are not a diehard family, okay, so we don't watch that. Um, and then we, after we watch all those movies, we spend the rest of the time watching all our Christmas movies, um, and we even watch those past Christmas until like. Um, Oh, uh, but uh, where Charlie Brown Christmas came from, it was originally a comic strip uh, created by Charles Schultz. And the whole reason why Charles Schultz put uh, uh, this scene in that, that comic strip was to remind his readers of what Christmas was really all about. It was about the Christ child. It was about God coming down to earth to dwell with us, doing the unthinkable uh, becoming God, become, or coming, coming from God to be human. And, 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 that, and, and that's the message that he wanted to get across. Um, and so uh, 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 I'm going to ask you the question is, 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 what is Christmas all about to you? What is Christmas all about? You see, the, 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 the time of Christmas is supposed to be a time of hope a time of joy, a time of excitement, a time where, where we remember uh, 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 Christ being born. But it seems that this Christmas season has turned into a season of anxiety, a season of depression, a season of stress, a season of frustration, a season of distraction, a season of materialism, and a season of selfishness. All right, we have made it all about these materialistic things rather than we take time to remember and celebrate that the, ph that the phenomenal cosmic power came to earth and dwelt in an itty bitty space of a child. Like, can you comprehend that? God, the creator of the world, the creator of the, of the cosmos, creator of you, came down as a child and dwelt, doing the unthinkable and dwelling with us. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now if we go back a couple weeks ago, we focused on the word Word and what that meant. Uh, in the Greek, the word references logos, which... <coughs> In layman's terms, uh, is defined the exact representation of God. Okay, the exact person of God. That was 
logos. And so what John is telling his Greek and Jewish readers is that the God became flesh and dwelt among us. All right, so Jesus is literally God made flesh. Jesus was not just a good teacher, among many other teachers. He is God, and he has come to dwell with us. And the cool thing about that dwelt is when we read all through Scripture from the Old Testament, we, we read different stories about how God dwelt with his people. We see it in the very beginning in Genesis, how he walked with Adam and Eve. Then we see it uh, when the it, it Israelites are free from Egypt and they are in the wilderness and they pitch their tents and, and they, 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 they pitch this humongous tent called the tabernacle and, and that is where God dwelt, the Spirit of God descended and dwelt in the tent in the center of the camp. And then uh, if we fast forward to the time of the kings with Solomon, uh, he built a temple and God dwelt in the holy of holies. And then we fast forward again to the Christmas season where he doesn't dwell in a tent and he doesn't dwell in a temple, but he dwells in a baby who's born <coughs> in a manger. You see, Jesus was not just a good teacher among many other teachers, he is <coughs> God. You see, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says this. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You see, it may seem unthinkable to some for the Son of God to actually dwell on the earth as a baby. You see, Jesus had to have his diaper changed. Jesus had to be fed by his mother. He needed his nose wiped, his fingernails and toenails trimmed. And you see, and it was this willingness to humble himself and to take on humanity's weaknesses that made Jesus' victory over death possible. God had to do the, do the unthinkable by coming down out of his throne room and dwelling in a baby. He had to do the unthinkable to save us. Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 or 8 say this, Who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming <clears throat> obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You see, it is only the Word, the exact representation of God, the God-man who sacrificed the death, it is, he is the only solution to our sin. He is the only solution to our freedom. And in order to experience death, you have to be a human. So God, doing the unthinkable, became a human to die for you. To die for me. The Word became flesh and dwelled among men. You see, the idea that God would go to such great lengths, becoming a human, a human himself in order to save an undeserving people sounds almost like a fairy tale. Almost too good to be true, but it is true and it is good news. And he did it in the most unthinkable way. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke chapter 2. And that's where we're going to be camping out today. But before we get into it, we need to kind of go, we kind of have to set up what we're going to be reading here. You see, there was this couple who was promised to be engaged or, or promised to be wed. It was Mary and Joseph. Mary was a teenager. Joseph was a carpenter. And as Mary is going about her life, preparing for her wedding, doing just whatever a teenage Jewish girl at that time would do, um, an angel appears to her and scares her. And she screams and shrieks and, ah! and puts her face down. And the angel's like, whoa, 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 calm it down, calm it down. All right? No need to be afraid. God has found favor on you. And God wants you 
to birth a child. But how am I supposed to birth a child if I am the virgin? All right. Well, God is going to come upon you, and you are going to be conceived or whatever, given the child by the Holy Spirit. Now, I would think Mary is still a little perplexed by this because I'm pretty sure she took some sex ed by her parents and kind of understands the process. But she's like, you know what? God is God. You do your shirt. Okay? I am willing. I am willing to be your servant. I am willing to be your vessel. And so God chose a teenage woman, a teenage girl, to birth the Savior of the world. And then let's fast forward to Joseph. When Joseph finds out that his beloved wife is pregnant, not with his child, because Joseph also took sex ed and understands how things work, he was going to divorce her quietly. But then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he was scared, and he was frightened. But the angel said, do not be afraid. For Mary is carrying God's child, and you shall give him the name Emmanuel, God with us. So Joseph woke and went, and he took Mary as his bride. And so God chose a teenager and a carpenter to birth and raise the Savior of the world. And so what happens in this section that we're going to read is that a census was issued or decreed that every uh, 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 Israelite needs to go to their hometown and register. And so Joseph and Mary make a 70 to about 90 mile ride or walk back <coughs> to Bethlehem. And it's when they arrive in Bethlehem that, oh, child is coming. And so this is where we pick up in verse 4 of, of chapter 2. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. All right, so let's pause there for a little bit. So God chose a teenager and a carpenter to be parents of him. Now you would think that God would want to choose a rich king or a wealthy family. I mean, after all, he is the king of kings. He is the almighty. Don't you think that he would want the best for himself? Do you think that he would come down so that he could be, be born into wealth, into riches, not born into poverty? Not born to a, 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 a teenage pregnancy situation. To not be born into a carpenter's life. You see, but that is what God does. He goes to an unwed couple. He creates a scandal. But you see, God saw something more in Mary than just a teenager. And he saw, a, he saw more in Joseph than just a carpenter. He saw good, respectable, and righteous individuals. He saw their heart. He saw their mind. He saw the way they lived. And you see, we might question as to why God would choose a, a, a teenager, why God would choose a carpenter. But you see, Joseph is part of the lineage of David, and David dealt with the same sort of judgment. The same sort of prejudice. You see, we read in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have, I have re rejected him. This is uh, <clears throat> in response to one of David's brothers. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so, my friends, don't ever look at yourself in the mirror and think that you were not good enough to be a vital member of God's family. You see, when you look at your limitations, when you look at your doubts, your fears, your insecurities, and you focus on those, you are robbing yourself and others of the gift, talents, and blessings that you are to, 
to us by God. You see, God did the unthinkable by choosing the lowly to birth the Savior. And He can do the unthinkable with you. You see, while they were in Bethlehem, while Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem, the child was ready to come, and Mary uh, uh, gave birth to the Messiah in Bethlehem, which fulfilled the prophecy made in Micah 5, too. A prophecy that was made four or five hundred years before this even took place. You see, a census had to be done to get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. You see, God had a perfect plan in place, and He knew the stuff that He had to put in place to make it a reality. And so Jesus was born. The promised King came to His people, but He did not have enough power to secure a resting place for His own birth. For Mary and Joseph went to a stable to lay the head of the King of Kings. And this is how God used earth's lowest to do the unthinkable and bring salvation from heaven's highest. You see, when Jesus was born, <clears throat> he wasn't born in some beautiful hospital. He wasn't born in his aunt's bedroom, or he wasn't born in a comfortable bed. No, Mary had to birth the Savior of the world in the stable. And what we learned last week is that there was most likely not an inn, because there's no identification of an inn. Hebrews, most likely they were a guest at their, rel at their distant relative's house. And how the houses were set up, it was like a tri-level. So like the first level was their garage, or where the animals were, and then you had the living area on the second floor, and then the guest rooms on the top floor. And so they were put at the bottom, in the garage, in the stable, with the animals. And the only place that Mary could put the Savior of the world was in a manger, which was actually a food trough where animals died, where animals ate. But you see, Mary had to do that for his protection. Because if Mary didn't put him in the food trough, then he would easily be trampled by all the animals that were in that stable. You see, God chose unthinkable people to birth and raise the Savior of the world. And Luke quickly changes scenes and he tells uh, uh, the angels appearing to some unlikely individuals. And so if we pick up in verse 8 of chapter 2, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said, said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good, good news of great joy that will be for all the, the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, the Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the, the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the, the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who, who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So the first announcement of the birth of the Savior of the world, God announced it to shepherds. He announced it to these, the, 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 these individuals that were not well respected in town. You see, shepherds were the least likely candidates, according to human standards, to first hear about the Messiah's birth. You see, why did the angels make their announcement to some of the important religious leaders of that time. You know, maybe it was because the religious guys were distracted by their political expectations. All right, a baby was the least of their expectations. A baby was the least of their problems or their concerns. You see, they missed the Messiah completely at his birth and his life. And shepherding had changed from a family business to a despised occupation. 
You know, many shepherds were actually accused of robbery and using land that they had no rights to. But it was on this particular night that we need a group of shepherds in a field watching over their sheep, making sure that they would not wander, making sure that the sheep were protected from, from predators that would seek to kill and destroy. And as these men are watching their lambs, the angels appear and in, and in front of them that, and inform them that the true lamb has been born. The lamb of God is here. The Messiah is here. Here. And when the angels appear to the shepherds, they, 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 they have to inform the, the shepherds, hey, don't be afraid. Because once again, whenever you come in contact with an angel, your natural re reaction is, ah, freaking out and scared. And the angel says, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news and great joy. You see, the gospel's purpose is to not bring fear to people. It is to bring joy. Joy comes not just to lowly shepherds or isolated parents far from home. Joy comes to all people. And it comes in the most unlikely place amid the most unlikely spectators. God brushed aside the world's fears and provided the world a reason for joy. See, joy centers not in something that you've earned or possessed. Joy comes from God's gift, a tiny baby in a feed truck. And so as this angel is sharing this message to the shepherd, a multitude of angels gather with the other. And they start singing songs of praise. They start singing a heavenly chorus. And once the angels depart, there was no waiting. There was no hesitation. There was no contemplating on the shepherd's uh, uh, minds. They immediately went to go see what this, the, the, this news was. To see this child where uh, the angels told them that it would be. And they ran to Bethlehem. They ran to the house where Jesus was, and they ran to the stable and saw the Christ child. And I wonder what their first thoughts were when they saw the child. I wonder if, there's, if they had the same attitude as Peter when he came face to face with Jesus. Do you remember that when Peter uh, uh, was in the boat and Jesus did the miraculous catch and Peter ran over to Christ and bowed down and put his face to the ground and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am not worthy. I wonder if that was the shepherd's response. I wonder if the shepherd's response were that of John the Baptist. I'm not even good enough to tie this man's sandals. I'm not good enough to be in his presence. You see, unfortunately, many of us feel that we are not worthy to be in God's presence. For many of us, we feel that, 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 that God can never look upon me for all of the mistakes and sin that I've done. God can never look upon me because I've ignored God. I've ignored Christ. I've ignored my relationship with Him. What we learn from the story is that God appeared to those with horrible reputations. God appeared to those who were looked down upon him in society. And God used two individuals that nobody would ever think of using. God used these shepherds to witness to others. You see, because after the shepherds saw the Christ child, what did they do? They went and they shared what they saw. They left and went to all the towns and all the people and anybody that would listen to them. They told them about the angels coming as they were sitting in the field and as the angels gathered together and sang this holy and heavenly tune. And as they ran to Bethlehem and they saw this baby in a manger, exactly how the angels have said. And they're sharing this. They're sharing the excitement for joy and good news has come into the world. They didn't even hesitate to share it. They ran and told everybody that they came in contact with. And God did the unthinkable. He chose a teenager and a carpenter to raise him. He chose to come as a baby and place in a trough. He chose to appear to shepherds and use them as witnesses to his birth. God does the unthinkable and he can do the unthinkable for you. For just like the shepherds were an unthinkable witness, we are the unthinkable 
witness. We are the witnesses that should be going out into our community and sharing everything that Christ has done for us, everything that Christ has done for them, everything that Christ has done for this world. You see, many times we allow ourselves to live according to what others' expectations of us are. We let those around us and our circumstances define how far we can go and what we can accomplish. <coughs> But church, it is time to rethink the boundaries that we've set around our lives. It's time to push the margins, press beyond the norm, and join hands with the one whose dreams for you are bigger than you think. You see, Mary and Joseph, they were just planning their wedding. They had no fathom, no thought that they were going to be met for something much more. But when they surrender to God, they allow God to dream for them, and they allow God to give them meaning, and they allow God to give them purpose, and they allow God to give them a reason to live. And so church, I want to challenge you to raise your level of expectation. I want you to take a close look at your life and ask yourself these tough questions. Alright, ask yourself, have I limited myself because someone said that I couldn't do something. Am I holding back because someone said I shouldn't try something new? Have I talked myself out of going somewhere that I have never been? Or maybe you have told yourself, I'm not good enough to be a leader. I'm not good enough to step up. I'm not good enough fill in the blank. You see, first you must trust God and have a desire to get close to God and not seek your own personal gain. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to guide your actions, not your ambitions. Focus on seeking and pleasing God first, not your community and certain religious leaders. You see, God wants to do in our lives what He did in Mary's, Joseph's, and the shepherds. He wants to heal our wounds. He wants to transform our marriages. He wants to save our children. He wants to bring us out of desperate circumstances, deliver us from bondage, and make us witnesses of honor. You see, our God has no limits, and He wants you to let Him do the unthinkable in and through you. You see, it's very difficult to, to, to preach Christmas story. It's very difficult to teach something that everybody knows. Even those who are not involved in the church know that the reason we celebrate Christmas or the reason why Christians celebrate uh, uh, this holiday is because God apparently became a baby and was born in a manger. I look around and many of you have been Christians for a very long time and have heard the story of Christmas at your homes, at the feet of your parents, at the feet of your grandparents, who sat in church services, who have told you the miraculous birth. And for many of us, we're like, yay, that's fine, that's cool, I gotta get to Christmas cooking. I gotta go buy presents for my family. I gotta do this. I, we know Jesus, God came down as man, dwelt among us. We get it. Why do we have to go over it every single time? If we get it, if we know the story, why don't we allow it to affect us? You see, unfortunately, the church has heard this story so many times that they just don't care anymore. They don't allow the fact that Jesus Christ is here and lives among us and that God dwelt with us. They don't realize what he has done and they just go about their lives doing whatever they want. Eh, this Christmas story, I don't need to hear it. Yes, you do. We need to be reminded of the extravagant love from God for you. There is no other religion that will teach you that their God came down as a baby for you. You see, we can't do anything to please God except submit to Him. God did it all. I have talked with ministers, and us ministers, we hate doing Christmas series. And the reason is because people in the pews just tune it out. Shoot, even I tune it out when I'm reading it to, throughout the week. But God did the unthinkable for you. The light came for you. Why do we just push it aside? Why 
don't we just read over it? Why don't we just ignore it? Why don't we allow it to, 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 to indwell in us? Why don't we allow it to move us to actually be men and women of God? Why don't we allow this story to move us to step up in the church and be leaders? To step up in the church and serve? To step up in the church and be an example instead of hiding behind our fears and our doubts? Mary and Joseph were scared out of their minds. She's a teenage girl, unwed and pregnant. All right, think about it. She's freaked out, but yet she knew that God was in control and that God was going to do something special in her. Give up your fears. Give up your doubts. Give up your insecurities. Let God dream for you. You can do so much more with me when you submit to God and allow Him to impact you and allow Him to dwell inside of you and to do something amazing. You see, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the follow, Father, full of grace and truth. God did the unthinkable so that we could know Him. God did the unthinkable so that we can do more. God did the unthinkable so you can stop looking at your insecurities, your fears, and your doubts and start looking at the one who gives you meaning and purpose. God did the unthinkable and He did it for you. And He did it for me. So why do we just limit the story as something that we read just once a year and focus on once a year? Why don't we allow this truth to uh, sink into our hearts, to sink into our souls, to sink into our lives? You see, God squeezed himself into a human body, especially that of a tiny baby. But his great love and perfect plan made the impossible possible. And we can know God and see his glory by knowing Jesus is God's only Son, worship you, go ahead and come on up. You see, God wants us to know that His love for us is real and visible. You see, if God just waved His arms and said, all is forgiven, we wouldn't believe it. It's our human nature to doubt that's even possible. And so God came down as a human to give us the evidence that he, in fact, was the Messiah to give us the, the reassurance that he truly does love us and that he truly wants to dream and do wonders, do the unthinkable in your life. You see, the angels have come and the angels have shared with you the glory and honor that is in Jesus Christ. The angels have come and they have sang of his wonders, <coughs> sang of the joy and brought you blessings of tidings of good cheer. And so if you are like the shepherds, which reality we are, are you going to ignore it and stay in your field and just stick with what makes you comfortable? Stick with what doesn't push you past your limits, pushes you out of your comfort zone? Or are you going to run to the manger? Are you going to run to the throne? Are you going to run to the foot of the cross? <clears throat> are you going to look upon Jesus and be in awe of his wonder? You see, Jesus came as a child, but he didn't leave as one. He left as God who conquered the grave through his death. He reigns forever at the right hand of God, waiting and longing for you to come to him. He is up there calling your name. He wants you to sit with him, just like how, how Mary sat at the feet of Jesus when he was here. He wants you to come and sit at, the feet, at his feet up in heaven. You see, Jesus came and he brought us a kingdom that has no end. And he is the king who will reign forever. Amen. And he wants to reign forever in your heart. He wants to dream for you. He wants to do something more. He wants to do the unthinkable in your life. Church, stop holding it back. Let him do the unthinkable.